I've been always interested in health research. We've wanted to develop this within our primary health care program just because we want to make sure that we're doing research properly. My main concern in doing research in the communities and with the services that we provide is making the best decisions, making the best use of resources that we have. I would like to be able to operate a health center that uses evidence in terms of determining where our resources should be, what policies need to be changed, what we should advocate with our governments for new additional funding. Research just makes us a more credible organization and I can't place enough emphasis on the need for evidence. I have conducted research in many settings. I've conducted research in educational settings, in health settings, and in school settings. One of the things that we need to do is that we need to identify a research topic, a research idea, a research problem, or else a research thesis statement. In my community and in the communities uh, that I have worked with, the research problem is something that has to be generated in a collaborative manner, and that's one thing that I know for sure. Research has to be done in a real, authentic, and genuine partnership. Researcher has to be flexible, and you have to be open-minded. Because true research and authentic research partnerships with Aboriginal communities means that you respond to the community needs, you value what they are saying, and that that research problem is generated by the collective partnership between yourself and the community. When you're doing research, you don't just look at, okay, our rate of diabetes is 50% among you know people above the age 50. Well, yes, that's true, but what you would be doing in research would be looking at the historical factors, the, the social cultural factors, what's been happening in our communities, um, putting it in a context or framework for understanding those, those issues. It's not just, you know, the numbers, which are important because you want to keep track of that, but also the context for those problems, why, the, why they've happened. And from there, then you can have an understanding or maybe from there, go to sort out, okay, we know why this has happened, so how are we going to address this? And, you know, really from a community perspective, because it's not going to work from an outsider coming in saying, yeah, you need to do this. Well, that's just not going to fly. You have to, it has to come from the community. People have to be um, aware of what's happened and willing to, um, I guess, motivated uh, to, to do something about it. One of the things that I learned from my experience in working with Aboriginal communities was that they're all different and they are all unique. Sometimes we, we tend to uh, generalize, but every community has specific needs. And I can give you a really good example. When I was in northwestern Ontario, Pekanjikum as an example, I'm sure there were a lot of health problems, chronic illness, etc. But the main problem when I was there was problems with suicide, youth suicide specifically. So although there were many other health-related problems at the time, uh, mental health issues and suicide was the biggest priority in that community. So that's where the focus needed to be. Other communities where communities have maybe better developed infrastructure, more programming, better resources, the health needs might not be as dire or as, as, as significant. So it really depends. So I think you really have to evaluate the community on an individual basis. The only way to identify the specific needs is to meet with key stakeholders, the important people in the community. And that doesn't mean just the healthcare providers or the politicians, but the elders, who sometimes are probably some of the most important sources of information at the community level. I think the biggest thing to keep in mind when doing health research in Aboriginal communities is that relationships are really, really important. When you're an outsider, it takes a really long time to develop that relationship. People really need to get to know you and it's going to take them a long time to trust you. And once they do, and once you've shown that the work that you do is ethical, it's respectful, that they will come back and, you know, get you to do more work with them. It's important too as an insider research as well. I mean, I'm a member of the First Nation community here and I do, you know, quite a bit of research in the other First Nation communities. 
they will always remember you for what you do. <laughs> they will always remember. So if you're doing, if you do a bad job, people will remember it. But if you do do good job, they will remember that too. So, yeah, relationships is the biggest thing I think. Trust is probably one of the most important things that a researcher and healthcare providers or anybody, an outsider coming into the community has to have with the community. And in order to gain that trust, people have to get to know you. People have to see that you've invested time into their community, into their lives, into their, their programs, into their services, that you're not just passing through. You're not there for a week or two, just doing your thing and then you're gone and that's it. I think you have to show respect uh, for the people uh, for the culture, for the beliefs, for the values. And sometimes that can be challenging because you come with your own set of values and, and your own beliefs and your own culture. And some of those things might clash, but just you can still respect other people's beliefs and cultures and values and not necessarily agree with them. That's okay. When you come to that realization about cultural differences, I think it makes things a lot easier. So uh, in order to be respected and to be trusted, I think you have to show respect and you have to earn that trust and it takes time. When working in Aboriginal communities, the gift of silence is very much a cultural norm. It is not uncommon when being in an Aboriginal community, either in a social setting or else in a research setting, for there to be times of silence. Aboriginal people are very comfortable with silence and often as researchers we're trained to not be comfortable with silence and to engage in dialogue and to ask more questions and to further elicit responses. Silence is a gift that gives us the time to really think about what we're about to say. It's about reflecting on what has been proposed. It is about reflecting on the conversation. It's about reflecting on the people that we are with. So I need to be comfortable with silence, and not only that, I also need to be comfortable with reflection. To really stop and think about the things that I am saying, what they mean, not just for myself, but what they mean for the community members and the people involved. One of the biggest things is that outsiders tend to talk too much and not give people enough time to, to respond back. So. Um, they're just spewing out information and then when they and when people don't immediately respond because we take our time and then they get nervous and they start talking more and keep talking more <laughs> um, but really you know just say what you know say if you know say you know a few things that you need to say and then wait and you know, give people time to respond they might and they might not respond right away either you may need to come back to the community and say I don't know, have you had time to consider this? Um, what do you think about it? it? Really just, I think, I, this is what I find is that people talk just way too much and it's actually considered rude in our communities if you talk too much and, and bragging about yourself. Oh, that's the other thing. <laughs> people don't really care about the letters behind your name. I mean, yeah, it's good. It's good that you have credentials, but don't brag about it. If you think, well, I work with the former national chief and blah, 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 and people just think you're full of yourself and you kind of turn people off. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing I find is you can't really brag about yourself. Be Just be humble, I suppose. If things come up in conversation, yes, you know, you can share that. Yes, you've done some work with whatever, but don't brag about it. You, you just approach really humbly because um, although it's changing in our communities, we're having, you know, there's more and more people who are educated, like have higher education, but a lot of the older people really don't, but they have, you know, a lot of learning and understanding and knowledge and experience that they don't have the degrees, but man, they're pretty damn smart. It was a workshop, and I don't even remember the workshop, but I just remember the teaching, and I remember the, uh, the teacher was Rosella Kaneshimug. The teaching was about how the Creator has given us two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. And that was sort of the beginning of the teaching. And the participants were asked, you know, to sort of talk about what do you make of that. And the message was we should listen and look twice as much as we speak. And one of the things that I've learned is I need to sit back, I need to observe, 
I need to listen to what's going on because that happens a lot. We often think that Aboriginal people are very nonverbal, don't say a lot, they're very quiet. But I think what's happening is they're being very introspective, they're very analytical, they're really sort of taking things in and will really process things before they say something. And you really see that in circles uh, with elders uh, who really listen to what's going on. And when they say something, they don't use a lot of words, but what they do say is very profound. So that's one of the things that I've learned and a quality that I've really tried to, um, to hone in on, uh, to listen, to be a really good listener, uh, and to really observe really well. And those are skills that are really important as a healthcare provider with what I do, because 80% of uh, identifying a health problem is in the history. Uh, you don't even have to lay hands on a person or order all kinds of fancy tests. If you really listen to what the person is telling you, often you can find the answer to what the problem is. And so that's a really important skill. As a researcher, we always have an agenda. Uh, we've reviewed the literature, we've identified a gap, and we find an area that we think needs to be researched. And that's what I've done. But I think you need to sort of step back from that. You need to sort of sit down with the people at the community level and say, this is where I'm coming from. What do you think of that? Am I on the right track? Do you agree with this? Or did I miss the boat? So you need to check in with people. And uh, and you may find out, and that's the scary part with using this methodology, that the, the path that you were planning on taking is not the path that you need to take or is not the path that you'll end up being on. If you're really going to do participatory research at the community level, it means that you can't drive the bus. You have to sort of sometimes take a back seat. You have to listen to what the people that are working with you have to say, and you have to empower and you have to allow other people to take on a leadership role at times. And we have to be open to the idea that uh, what we thought was the phenomenon of interest may not actually be the phenomenon of interest. It may be something completely different. My research interests really focus on chronic illness and type 2 diabetes in particular. Type 2 diabetes was considered a disease of adults, uh, older people. Children usually develop type 1 diabetes, but what's been happening is people are being diagnosed younger and younger, and we even have children under the age of 10 now being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which I think is, is alarming. One of the areas that I found in reviewing the literature that was really lacking was the qualitative aspect of living with this chronic illness. The approach I'm proposing in terms of my methodology is participatory action research. When I delved into the colonization literature, it really sort of led me into looking at participatory action research. That methodology is very broad in some respects, and that's a little bit disconcerting because I have a, an agenda. I have three years to get this research done, but I also realize that when you use a participatory action research methodology, when you're working in the communities, the timelines that you propose may not turn out to be exactly what you expect. So that's a little bit kind of disconcerting, but practically um, I'm looking forward to the experience. I grew up in Sagamook First Nation and had a really interesting and different childhood. For sure, uh, there's definite differences between my community and a community outside of my First Nation. And it was certain concepts of how we lived our lives. And one of the key concepts was everything was shared. People didn't own property. You didn't own this, you didn't own that. Growing up in my community was about sharing. In fact, I don't even know the word for ownership or owning in the Ojibwe language. So when I think about doing research and conducting research, there's a real emphasis, especially as a scholar, that you need to own it. Well, we own the research. We own it as the author. And that is highly problematic. Because the ownership of research when working with Aboriginal communities, it's not that the researcher owns it, it is shared. Every community that I have worked with, I have acknowledged that that is their information, that I don't control that information and that I don't own it. And that is part of being respectful in research, is that acknowledging that as part of this journey, I have taken many gifts, I have learned I've learned from the people, I've learned about myself, but also acknowledging that the information that I have gathered, that that is a gift that belongs with the people.
If you're doing research in a community, that means you need to give back to the community. So whether that means training and hiring local researchers, making sure that um, part of your research dollars are spent in the community. So that's what I would call a superficial level that it's important, but really the other kind of reciprocity that I'm thinking about as well is there's an exchange of ideas and knowledge. So you're actually co-generating new knowledge. Every research project I've done, I have always learned so much. Yeah, so, so much from the people. People have such different perspectives that uh, I always learn so much and I'm really, really glad for that. And I guess my, you know, my role as a researcher, I help to, you know, kind of, I hope to crystallize and th synthesize that information. It's so important you're able to have that reciprocal relationship where the researcher is learning from the community, but also the community is learning from that researcher. You know, maybe the terminology or just, just ways of doing things that, so that the community is learning too, so you're working together. I think for all of us, we have one of the teachings of love, and love means a lot in context to a researcher working with the communities. And it's just compassion for the people that they're working with empathy in understanding their situation, knowing that as a researcher they're going to learn a lot more than they had when they first walked into the community, and taking that information and valuing it, not just using it again for research or for publications, but really from the heart understanding that they've gained additional knowledge and information that they didn't have, and that in itself was a gift that the First Nation and the people gave them. And I think if that makes them a better person, a better human being, on top of academic purposes, that's a bonus for the researcher to be able to come away with a, a different heart, a different understanding, and a different frame of mind when it comes to working with First Nation people and understanding their challenges they have in health. <laughs>